Well, good morning. I'm sitting here having my coffee and reading before uh, Mass. And one of the things um, I actually read yesterday, I'm looking over today, is a column by William Grider. William Grider, I first became aware of when he wrote uh, an article for Rolling Stone magazine. It was actually part of a book, and he also did a series for uh, PBS. And the name of all those was called Who'll Tell the People? This was in the early 90s, and what he was talking about is that our power structures in our, in our government had changed, and it was a famous CEO he had talked to who had realized that he, if he wanted to have influence on the government, he shouldn't go into politics, he should go into business. And therefore, he realized that that's where uh, the influence was to change public policy. Well, of course, that also changes our democracy if really the power is in business as opposed to politics. So he put together this series, Who Will Tell the People? Now, one of the interesting things <clears throat> that he says in this column that he just wrote for the nation, and what makes that interesting is there's virtually nothing I would normally agree with in the nation, but um, here it's called Economic Freefall. It's by William Grider, and he says that we have the issue, of course, of deregulation happened um, prior to, he says, he says, even Ronald Reagan came to town. So prior to Ronald Reagan, which makes it into the Carter administration in 1980, um, and <clears throat> this deregulation was a step that doomed a lot of our financial issues, including the savings and loan industry. Now, the <clears throat> everything ended up being bipartisan, and it's built on a bipartisan level, so it's not re Republicans or Democrats, it's bipartisan. And he says that one of the major issues, and this is uh, kind of fascinating to read this, is the prohibition against usury. Now, if you don't know what usury is, it is lending at interest, it's something that our whole country just lives upon. And <clears throat> what's interesting in light of that is it's an ancient practice. Um, it's ancient prohibition. It's obviously an ancient practice, but the prohibition for usury go all the way back to the book of Leviticus and beyond. And so what happens is um, this practice that is part of our country is rejected. And what William Grider says, the problem that we had when we now allowed usury, he says, is that here this practice has been forbidden because, as he says, people of great wealth must not be allowed to use it to ruin others who lack the same advantages. A decent society cannot endure it. Thank you, William Grider. Now, lending at usury is often used to enslave people in different parts of the world. The Columbans have a great movie where they talk about a priest who was able to, in the Philippines, to free people who were um, lent money at usury, and then they had to go work for the company or the person um, who lent them the money, and the person would run a small a sugarcane processing plant. Well, the problem is that person paid them only enough money to survive and not enough money to pay back the loan. So the person just bought himself a bunch of slaves. What this priest did is he went in and he built a kibbutz that also processed sugarcane. And in the kibbutz, of course, you know that everyone works together and basically everyone owns the kibbutz. As a matter of fact, um, kind of an interesting thing is uh, Gorbachev, Mikhail Gorbachev, who visited a kibbutz after he left the Soviet Union and after he ended the Soviet Union. And he said, this is what we were trying to build in the Soviet Union, a place where people owned everything, a place where people benefited for, from all their work collectively. Well, the kibbutz is also an ancient Jewish practice. So anyway, he built this kibbutz and it became and and it became very productive. Now, how we got the workers? He paid off the loans of various workers, who then could work for him, and then they were free to do uh, work to to earn money and um, to live freely. The issue is the kibbutz became more productive and therefore more profitable than the other sugarcane processes that were living off this usury slavery system, which angered a lot of people and he ended up being deported from the Philippine government, from the Philippines, by the Philippine government. So you look at this, but you look at also, this is a practice that is used throughout the world to enslave and to um, keep people down. 
It's also used by drug dealers. What you'll have is you'll have a low-level drug dealer. Say, for example, he's working for some um, high, high guy back in um, the Dominican Republic. So low-level drug dealer gets caught, gets arrested, gets thrown in jail. Um, they set a bail for him. We'll just say hypothetically $25,000. Man from Dominican Republic sends $25,000, bails the man out. That man he bailed out now goes back to the Dominican Republic and has to pay back that loan, but he's only paid a small amount of money, so he can't pay back the loan, and basically lives in slavery to the, the top-level drug dealer back in the Dominican Republic. These kind of practices happen all the time, and when we look at that, we go back to what um, William Greider says just on the simple everyday level of the American consumer, how this usury practice is something that should never have happened. We see a powerful message and something to look at, but the other thing is, again, how can we put the so-called genie back in the bottle? Good question, um, but good comments from William Greider. Have a good day.